Hello everyone, this lecture is part two of our chapter 12 um, lecture on the central nervous system. So the first part we talked about the cerebral hemispheres, the cerebral cortex, gray matter, white matter, and the um, basal nuclei. So now we're going to start talking about some other structures that you can find in the brain. So deep to the cerebral hemispheres, we have a... Um, group of structures collectively known as the diencephalon, right? So if this here is your cerebral hemispheres, um, more superficially, your diencephalon is this deep part in the middle, okay? Um, your diencephalon consists of three paired gray matter structures. So paired means that they're found in both of the hemispheres. So we have our thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus, so our thalamus is going to be this round kind of um, ball in the middle there. Our hypothalamus is um, inferior and anterior to our thalamus, so here um, in the front. And then the epithalamus is to the posterior of the thalamus, so this back here made up of the pineal gland and posterior commissure. So all three of those together make up the diencephalon. So let's talk a little bit more about each. So first of all, the thalamus um, is the major part of the diencephalon. It makes about 80% of it. It has bilateral nuclei, so a nucleus on either side um, of the brain, so on each hemisphere. And they're connected by a structure called the interthalamic adhesion or intermediate mass. So if I zoom back over here, um, if this is the thalamus in the middle, I'll erase that. Um, so this is the thalamus, right? This little ball in the middle is going to be the interthalamic adhesion. So each hemisphere has a nucleus, uh, thalamus, excuse me, and then this interthalamic adhesion is the part that connects the thalamuses in both hemispheres, okay? So two little thalami, so these will both be connected by the interthalamic adhesion. The thalamus contains several different nuclei named based on their location, so in here you can see all the different nuclei. Um, I'm not going to have you know the names or the functions of each one of those, just kind of the thalamus in general. Um, but the nuclei project and receive fibers from the cerebral cortex. So different nuclei are going to have a little bit different functions, connect to different parts of the cortex. Um, but in general, the thalamus is function is to act as a relay station for information coming into the cortex. Okay, so all the information coming to the brain first comes to the thalamus, um, and the thalamus is going to sort, edit, and then relay that information. So, for example, impulses from the hypothalamus for regulating emotion and visceral functions first comes to the thalamus and then goes to other areas in the brain. Impulses from the cerebellum and the basal nuclei um, go to the thalamus to help direct motor cortices. Okay, and then information... Impulses from memory or sensory integration. So any sensory information coming in from the periphery, so if that's some sort of tactile information or some information on proprioception, it first is going to come to the thalamus before it gets sent um, to its designated sensory cortex. Okay. Overall, it mediates sensation, it mediates motor activities, it mediates cortical arousal, learning, and memory. Um, so it kind of has a role in all of our functions. Because, again, any sensory information coming in goes through the thalamus and then motor information going out as well. Okay. The next structure of the diencephalon is the hypothalamus, which is below and a little bit to the front of the thalamus. Um, it has a lot of different important nuclei. Um, so, for example, one of them is going to be our mammillary bodies, which in this image are these little blue guys down there. Um, they act as an olfactory relay station. Um, and we have the infundibulum coming down from the hypothalamus that is connecting the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland. Okay, so this image down here, our hypothalamus is all of these nuclei collectively, right? So that's the hypothalamus. Our pituitary gland is the main endocrine organ that kind of hangs down right below um, the hypothalamus. And then the infundibulum is just this little stalk that's connecting the hypothalamus to that pituitary gland. Okay. 
Functions of the hypothalamus, there are a lot of them. Um, the hypothal hypothalamus is the main visceral control and regulating center that's vital to homeostasis. Okay, um, because it's connected to that pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland is a big endocrine organ, um, the hypothalamus kind of has a big say in some of those homeostatic controls. So, for example, it controls the automatic, autonomic nervous system, so things like blood pressure, um, blood, the rate and force of your heartbeat, digestive tract, motility, pupil size, all those autonomic controls um, are controlled through the hypothalamus um, and also initiates some physical responses to emotions. Um, so it's integrated with the limbic system. It perceives pleasure, fear, rage, different biological rhythms, so your circadian rhythm um, and drive such as your sex drive. So a lot of um, wide functions. Um, and some other ones, <laughs> there's a lot of them, like I said, um, regulating body temperature. So again, some autonomic um, homeostatic control. So control sweating and shivering to make sure our body temperature stays at its set point. Regulating hunger and uh, satiety in response to nutrient blood levels or hormones. Um, so if our uh, blood sugar gets low, it's going to respond to that. Regulates water balance and thirst. So again, a lot of those autonomic functions are going to be controlled by our hypothalamus. So our sleep-wake cycle, um, we have the suprachiasmatic nucleus um, of our thalamus sets our biological clock, and our hypothalamus kind of integrates that information and regulates our circadian rhythm. Our suprachiasmatic nucleus, um, we haven't talked about the cranial nerves yet, but our optic nerve... Um, is the nerve that brings information from our eyeballs back into our brain, right, from our retina. And there's a point in our optic nerve where they cross, and that's called the optic chiasm. Okay, directly um, superior to the optic chiasm is where you're going to find the suprachiasmatic nucleus, supra, think like above the chiasm. Um, so the suprachiasmatic nucleus basically takes information from our optic chiasm on daylight, how much light is getting through, um, and sets that biological clock. So if there's not much light coming through that um, optic chiasm because it's dark outside, um, it's going to make us want to sleep, right? Um, so that's kind of, it's one of my favorite parts of the brain. Um, and then also hypothalamus, like I said, it controls some different endocrine system functions since it is in such close relation to um, the pituitary gland. Um, so different secretions of the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus is actually controlling. And then it actually produces the posterior pituitary hormones, um, which is kind of cool. If you take a class like endocrinology, you'll learn a lot more in depth about this stuff. This is, again, like I've said in the last few lectures, we're really just skimming the surface here. Okay. Okay, and then the third part of your diencephalon is the epithalamus, which is the most dorsal portion. So it's this kind of purple spot back there. Um, it contains the structure called the pineal gland or pineal body, um, which you can see over here. And that extends on the very back side, the posterior side. The pineal gland is cool because it secretes melatonin, which is um, a chemical that helps regulate that sleep-wake cycle as well. Okay. So those are the parts of the diencephalon, or yep, the diencephalon, which again is just this middle part of the brain, our thalamus, hypothalamus, and epithalamus with the pineal gland. Um, and then the next part, there's two more parts of the brain we have to talk about. One is the brain stem, and then we have the cerebellum. Okay, so let's start by talking about um, the brain stem first. So our brain stem consists of three main regions the midbrain, pons, and medulla oblongata. Um, so you can see on your, on your um, brainstem here, right? Midbrain is kind of hard to see because it's kind of up in here. Midbrain, pons is there, and then this third bump is the medulla. And the brainstem is similar in structure to the spinal cord, but it contains nuclei that are embedded in white matter. Okay, so it's a little bit different functionality than the spinal cord. Um, it controls a lot of automatic behaviors necessary for survival. 
And there's obviously going to be, like all areas of the brain, a fiber tract connecting higher and lower level neural centers. Okay, so if we're controlling all these automatic behaviors, there's going to need to be some integration between the structure of the brain stem and other um, areas of the brain. Okay, so first let's talk a little bit more about our midbrain. It's the most, um, I'm going to say, superficial part of the brain stem. So I'm going to go back to this image really quick. Um, so if you zoom in on the brain stem, just so you can see, the midbrain is this most superficial region, or superior, excuse me. Um, uh, pons is kind of in the middle, and then the medulla is the most inferior. Okay. So I said I wrote superficial here. I'm gonna write superior. <laughs> most superior. Um, it has t these two cerebral peduncles, which are just these like bulges that can contain some motor tracks. Um, so they kind of connect the um, cerebrum, the motor areas. Um, we have a cerebral aqueduct running through the midbrain, which is a channel that connects the third and fourth ventricles. So it's filled with that cerebral spinal fluid. And then there's going to be some gray matter that surround that cerebral aqueduct called periaqueductal gray matter. Okay, and they're going to be nuclei that play a role in pain suppression and our fight or flight response of our sympathetic nervous system. Okay. The midbrain, um, like I said, have a lot of different nuclei that are scattered throughout the white matter. Um, so if you look at the midbrain, if we do like a transverse cross section, you can see all these different um, nuclei within the midbrain. And then if I zoom in really quick, this here would be that cerebral aqueduct. So again, it's connecting the third and the fourth ventricles filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So our nuclei, we have our corporal quadrumina which are paired dorsal protrusions um, that are made up of, we have our superior clicculi and our inferior clicculi, and you'll learn those in lab. Superior clicculi are the visual reflex centers. Inferior are the auditory reflex centers. We have our substantia Niagara, which is um, functionally linked to our basal ganglia, the basal nuclei. In Parkinson's disease is actually a degeneration of this area. So, um, like I said, it involves a lot of dopaminergic neurons um, controlling um, some fine-tuned motor movements and motor sequences. And then our red nucleus um, is a really nuclei for some descending limb flexion motor pathways. Um, so, um, controls some of our um, arm movements. Um, and it's also part of the reticular formation, technically, which we'll talk about what that is in a little bit. Okay, this, I understand there's a lot of terms here. It's a lot of just memorization. Um, I'd recommend probably making flashcards um, for the functions of a lot of these structures. Okay, so inferior to the midbrain is our pons. So it's the middle of the structures in the brainstem. Um, like other parts of the brainstem, it's going to have some conduction tracks. So we have longitudinal fibers that connect the higher brain centers and the spinal cord um, and transverse dorsal fibers that relay impulses between the motor cortex and cerebellum. Okay. Um, it's also the pons is the origin of cranial nerves five and six, the trigeminal abducens, as well as seven, the facial nerve. And you'll learn those nerves in a lab. And then some nuclei in the pons are going to play a role in the reticular formation, which again we'll talk about in a minute, and maintain a normal breathing, rhythm of breathing. Okay, so again, brainstem is a lot of those autonomic behaviors. So controlling your breathing rate, um, obviously you're not thinking about that, um, which is why if we have damage to our brainstem, it can have um, severe implications because that's where a lot of our autonomic Things are occurring such as heart rate, breathing rate, um, etc. Okay, and the most inferior part of our brainstem is the medulla or medulla oblongata, um, which contains the fourth ventricle, um, which continues the central canal of the spinal cord um, and contains in the fourth ventricle a structure known as a choroid plexus, which is a capillary rich membrane that forms the cerebral spinal fluid. Okay, so like I said, the cerebrospinal fluid is um, kind of a filtrate of our blood plasma. 
So our choroid plexus has a lot of capillaries um, in the membrane surrounding it. Um, so it's where most of our cerebrospinal fluid is going to be made. Okay. Functions of the medulla, like a lot of the spinal cord, there's a lot of different functions. Um, most importantly, autonomic reflex center. Um, so a lot of the functions of the medulla overlap with the hypothalamus. Um, and the hypothalamus kind of decides what to do, and it relays the instructions to the body through the medulla. So the hypothalamus and medulla really work together. But in the medulla, you're going to have a cardiovascular center, um, and it adjusts for force and rate of heart contraction. Um, and the vasomotor center adjusts blood vessel diameter for blood pressure regulation. So a lot of cardiovascular functions controlling heart rate and blood pressure as well as respiratory centers, so generating the rhythm um, of our respiratory and controlling the rate and depth of um, our breathing. Okay, so there's other um, centers, again, that regulate vomiting, hiccuping, swallowing, coughing, and sneezing as well in the medulla. Okay, so again, that brain stem, most, oops, most superficially, we have our midbrain, then we have our pons and our medulla inferior that's connecting our uh, brain to the spinal cord down below. Okay, um, behind our midbrain and pons, we have like our cerebral aqueduct, right? And then our fourth ventricle down um, behind our bottom of the pons and the medulla. Okay, so a lot of autonomic behaviors, autonomic, are controlled in our brain stem, like I said. Um, and they have a lot of integration, obviously, with other parts of the brain as well. Okay, and then the last brain structure I think we have to talk about is the cerebellum, which is this little hind brain behind um, the brain stem and kind of below and behind the cerebrum up here. So cerebellum makes up about 11% of the brain mass. Um, it's dorsal to the pons and medulla. And the cerebellum um, processes input from the cortex, brainstem, sensory receptors, and it provides precise coordinated movements of skeletal muscle. Okay, so cerebellum is going to play a big role in um, movement and also a major role in balance. Okay. There are, like the cerebrum hemispheres, we have cerebellar hemispheres, which I don't think I put a picture to show it, but we have, like, this would be one hemisphere here, and on the other side, there's going to be a second hemisphere, and they're connected by a structure called the vermis. Each hemisphere has three lobes, um, our anterior lobe, posterior lobe, um, and the fibocondylar lobe. <laughs> and within the cerebellum, you're going to have thin um, gray matter superficially, just like your cerebrum, and this distinctive tree-like pattern of white matter called the arbor vitae. So if I zoom in, this is your cerebellum, right? The white matter superficially or the gray matter, excuse me, superficially, is all of this stuff, right? So all your gray matter is the cerebellar cortex, similar to the cerebral cortex, right? So that's all your cerebellar gray matter. And then deep to that, you have the white matter. So you can see the white matter goes all on the inside of this, and it kind of looks like a tree, right? Which is why it's called the arbor vitae. We also have our cerebellar peduncles. Um, so here, showing our cerebellar peduncles. They are um, going to be, all the fibers in our cerebellum are going to be ipsilateral, um, which is the opposite of contralateral. So remember, contralateral, we said the brain, the left side controls the right side of the body and vice versa. Ipsilateral means that the same side of the cerebellum controls the same side of the body. So from and to the same side of the body. So the right cerebellum controls the right body, left cerebellum, left body. Okay. Um, so these peduncles are fiber tracks that connect the cerebellum to the brainstem. 
Okay, so the, cere- the superior connects the cerebellum to the midbrain, middle, cerebellum to the pons, and inferior, the medulla to the cerebellum. Okay, so it just superior, middle, and inferior there, just connecting the cerebellum to the brain stem. Okay. Um, and like I said, the cerebellum controls a lot of motor activity, um, so it is able to fine-tune motor activity. So what it does basically can be divided into four steps. Um, it receives impulses from the cerebral cortex of an intent to initiate movement, It also receives signals from proprioceptors throughout the body, which are the receptors that kind of sense where our body's at in space, as well as visual and equilibrium pathways. And these are going to inform the cerebellum where the body is at in space. And if it's already in motion, it tells the cerebellum, you know, um, what kind of momentum the body already has, how it's moving, which way it's moving currently. Um, The cerebellar cortex calculates the best way to smoothly coordinate muscle contractions to provide a movement that the um, cerebral cortex wants integrated with what the body's already doing. So it takes, you know, where we want to go and integrates it with where we're at and what we're already doing to create a movement that's smooth and controlled, okay? And it sends a blueprint of this coordinated movement to the cerebral motor cortex and the brainstem nuclei. Okay. Neuroimaging also suggests that the cerebellum plays a role in thinking, language, and emotion. Um, So again, a lot of these um, brain areas that we're talking about, there's still a lot of research being done. Um, So we don't know the full functionality of everything. We do know that everything's kind of intertwined. So You're never going to see one brain area that just does everything on its own. You're going to have a lot of integration happening. Um, But like motor processes for these, it may compare actual output of higher functions with expected output and adjust accordingly. So it's kind of like recognizing what the body's already doing with what the brain wants the body to do or wants the body to think and kind of integrating the information. Okay. So those are all the parts of the brain. The next section here are some functional brain systems. So it's networks of different neurons that work together, but they're going to be spanning a wide area of the brain. So we have two systems we're going to talk about, our limbic system and our reticular formation. Um, And again, they aren't like actual structures. They're going to be composed of a number of different structures found in different areas, if that makes sense. So we're going to start with our limbic system. Um... They have structures of medial aspects of the cerebral hemispheres and our diencephalon. So again, some areas and, and some, some uh, structures in different areas of the brain. We have a white matter tract called the fornix that links the limbic system regions. It's similar to the corpus callosum, um, but kind of inferior to it. It includes, again, um, part of the diencephalon and some cerebral structures that encircle the brainstem. And the limbic system is the large part of the emotional or affective brain. So all of our emotions that we feel really are controlled by our limbic system. So we have the amygdaloid body, which recognizes angry or fearful facial expressions, assesses danger, and elicits a fear response. So the amygdala really is kind of the fear um, control center. And then the cingulate gyrus, which plays a role in expressing emotions via gestures and resolves mental conflicts. Okay, so here's uh, showing you the structures of the limbic system. Um, So the main ones that we talked about, the amygdala, is this structure down here. Um, Hippocampus plays a role in it. The fornix is the white matter tract that connects the hemispheres here. Um, and then the cingulate gyrus up there. A lot of other areas as well involved in the uh, limbic system. Okay, but again, the limbic system is just putting an emotional response um, to a lot of things. So a fear response or a happy response or even a disgust response. So um, if you smell like a disgusting odor, like a skunk smell or whatever, the limbic system is the part of the brain that's uh, making you recognize that as disgust. Okay. 
Limbic system is also going to be interacting with our prefrontal lobes. Um, so it allows us to react emotionally to things that are consciously understanding, understood to be happening. Okay, so not only just like sensations that are disgusting or emotional, um, but having that higher level thinking in our prefrontal cortex, um, making us happy, have, uh, being, allowing us to reflect on things that are happening, looking at our memories, um, and having those memories have some sort of emotion associated with them. So hippocampus um, and the amygdala together play a role um, in memory. Again, I talked about this previously, but our hippocampus um, stores a lot of our memories, but the amygdala is really important in kind of making those memories meaningful. So again, associating some sort of emotion to a memory will make it um, last longer. Okay, so that's the um, limbic system. We also have our reticular formation, um, which we talked about some structures previously that are part of the reticular formation, um, but it kind of extends through the central core of the brainstem. So we have a, different columns, the raphi nuclei, the medial group of nuclei, and lateral group of nuclei. Um, but the reticular formation has a lot of connections with other areas of the brain. So our hypothalamus, thalamus, the cerebral cortex, cerebellum, and spinal cord. Um, so it's really connected to everything. And its main function is arousal. Okay, so these wide connections allow the reticular formation to govern the arousal of the entire brain. Okay, and it controls arousal through a... Uh, system called the reticular activating system or RAS. So basically it sends impulses to the cerebral cortex to keep it conscious and alert. Okay, so that's what allows our brain to kind of stay awake and um, be alert, keep, you know, an eye on what's happening. It's also important for filtering out repetitive, familiar, or weak stimuli. So if we are um, listening to or sitting around and we have um, just like a sound happening in the background. Eventually, once that sound is like very repetitive, we're going to filter it out and not pay attention to it. Um, and it's our reticulating, reticular activating system that allows us to do this. Um, the RAS is inhibited by sleep centers, which is important because we don't want our brain to be aroused if we're trying to sleep, um, by alcohol and some drugs, not all drugs, but some of them, and severe inner injury to our um, reticular formation can result in permanent unconsciousness, which is just a coma. Okay. So those are the main systems of the brain. And I included these uh, major brain regions and kind of their functions, kind of this um, um, summary chart here. So if you want to take a look at this when studying, I think this would be a good thing to look at. It has all the things we talked about. Um, and its functions and kind of where it's at in the brain. And then the very last part of lecture this week, I want to talk about some higher mental functions. So things like language, memory, um, brain waves, consciousness, and the sleep-wake cycles. Um, so I'll, again, we're just going to keep very superficial on these different functions. Um, if you go into further classes, there's a lot more information um, on this stuff that I could be talking about, but I just want to give you kind of a, a quick run through of these different things and how they're going to use different parts of the brain. So starting with language, um, language implantation system involves association cortex of the left hemisphere. So we talked about cerebral dom dominance. Um, most people have these language systems in their left side of the brain, um, but some people do have them in the right. But two major language areas are the Broca's area, which is involved in speech, speech production, right? Which was that motor area um, that controlled our, the movements that produce speech. Patients, if they have a lesion or a damage to Broca's area, understand words still, but they cannot form, um, you know, speech that is meaningful. They can still talk, make noise, um, but what the words, if you'll, you could even call them words, that they produce are nonsensible. So they would still be able to make sounds and they understand language and uh, uh, know what they're like trying to say, but they just can't produce the words. OK, 
okay? And Wernicke's area um, is involved in understanding spoken and written words, okay? So they are allowed, they, patients with lesions here can still speak as, um, still speak, but the words here are going to be non nonsensible because they can't understand um, words, okay? So like I said, with the cerebral dominance, the left side of the brain typically is going to control these areas, um, which means the opposite side of the brain, you're not going to have a broken Wernicke's area on both sides of the brain. So the corresponding areas on the opposite side, for, so for our example, on the right side, are going to be involved in nonverbal language components. Okay, so again, all areas of our brain are going to be used. So these areas that on the left side are for broken Wernicke's on the right side are going to be involved in these nonverbal language. Okay, and just to show you, um, Broca's area, I already showed you before, but the motor area controlling movement of speech, production of speech is up there, and Wernicke's area would be more posterior to that, and that's um, the understanding of language. Okay, memory obviously is going to be the storage and retrieval of information. So there's a few different kinds of memory that are stored and retrieved different ways. We have declarative memory, which is the memory of facts. So things like names, faces, words, dates. Procedural memory is the memory of skills or knowing like how to do something. So like playing piano or swinging a baseball bat, um, you know, movements, procedural memory. Um, motor memory is the mo memory of motor skills. So I guess swinging about would be better here. Riding a bike, um, any sort of motor movement. Emotional memory is memory of experience linked to an emotion. Um, so the heart pounding when you hear a rattlesnake or rem remembering like a scary time in your life. So when you think back on that scary time, you have that emotional experience linked to it. Okay. For declarative memory... Um, the memory of facts, um, we have two stages of storage that we can have. We have short-term memory and long-term memory. So short-term memory is also known as working memory. It's just a temporary holding space. Um, so if you're remembering something, thinking about something, trying to remember a phone number or something, um, that would just be in your short-term memory, remembering it for a little bit of time. And it's typically limited to seven or eight pieces of information, Okay. Um, so we can group information together to make, um, kind of trick our body into remembering more, but not much information can be hold, held in the short-term memory. Long-term memory is remembering something um, for a long time, right? So if you come years later, you can still remember something, that would be in your long-term memory. And this has a limitless capacity, okay? Obviously, to have something go to long-term memory, we need to um, transfer it from our short-term memory. Um, so everything starts in short-term memory and then eventually, if we rehearse it enough, um, can be sent to the long-term memory. So there's some things that affect the transfer from short-term to long-term. Our emotional state, um, so it's easier to remember things long-term if we're alert, motivated, surprised, or aroused. So if there's some sort of emotional response associated with a memory, um, it's easier to remember that in the long term. Rehearsal, um, so if we repeat something or practice it, so studying your notes, um, repeating stuff with flashcards, um, that is easier to remember long term as well. Association is tying new information with old information, um, and it's a lot easier to recall information if we um, tie it to old information. So if you're learning something um, about, I don't know, the brain and you can relate that to something else that you learned previously, um, it's easier to remember that in the long term if we have those associations formed. And then the automatic memory um, is just subconscious information that's stored in long-term memory. Um, yeah. So memory consolidation um, is involves fitting new facts into categories that are already stored in the cerebral cortex. Um, so you have outside stimuli um, that come in, go to short-term memory, and if we rehearse it enough, it can be sent into long-term memory and consolidated. Okay, So the hippocampus, 
the temporal cortical areas, thalamus, prefrontal cortex, those are all involved in consolidation. So again, consolidation of memories is just taking these um, facts and facts in the short-term memory and storing them in the cerebral cortex in different areas for retrieval later. Okay. All right. And then um, the last slide here is just talking about consciousness. Consciousness is the perception of our sensation. So our ability to perceive that we are alive and sensing things is what allows us to have this consciousness, which is kind of weird to talk about. Um, but it's voluntary initiation and control of movement and capabilities associated with higher mental processing. So memory, logic, judgment, etc. There's a lot of studies still being done on consciousness and what really consciousness is. Um, but kind of a combination of being able to sense stuff, being able to move, and being having these higher mental processes are what currently we consider consciousness to be okay clinically it's defined on a continuum that grades behavior in response to a stimuli so alert drowsiness or some sort of lethargy stupor and then coma okay um, again some current theories it involves um, simultaneous activity of large cortical areas superimposed on other neural activities and is holistic and totally interconnected Okay, so consciousness is just all of our brain being able to work together, process incoming information, um, understand that information, and being able to output information as well. Um, so during sleep, we're, we're technically not conscious because we're not um, being able to do this higher mental processing with memory, logic, judgment, etc., um, if we have, if we're in a coma, we're unconscious for an extended period of time. Um, brain death is like an irre irreversible coma. Um, comas typically are reversible. Um, if we get to a point where it's irreversible, that would be um, brain death. Um, and then things like fainting is just a brief loss of consciousness. A lot of times it's due to low blood pressure. Um, so your brain's not getting enough um, blood flow, oxygen, the nutrients that it needs. Um, but anytime we lose consciousness, we're going to be losing um, these abilities. No ability for sensation, control of movement, and these higher level processes. All right, that is it for chapter 12. Let me know if you have any questions.